So raise your hand in the room this morning if you have ever felt like taking revenge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for these boys, it's not so much if they've ever felt like taking revenge. It's um, yeah. taking yeah. revenge. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. as you know, kids and siblings, they uh, it's a downward spiral. One person pushes the other, then the other is entitled to a push, and then it's just a fight <laughs> ensues. We all face this temptation of vengeance of revenge um when you or someone you love you know the older you get the more you can tolerate being mistreated right i mean when you're younger you you're the center of the world right you're the, you're god's gift to humanity so if anybody harms you then revenge must be enacted but when you get older it's like okay i can kind of handle it a bit better but when someone you love is um hurt or taken advantage of uh, uh, maybe a uh, a spouse or a child or something then then the, that that wrath that burns in your chest uh, ignites uh, that's when it's almost impossible no, it is impossible i'm going to say it is impossible to extinguish that wrath in your chest by yourself you can't do it by yourself only god can do this for you and he must do it or else we're just going to uh, you know, you've ever heard the saying, get better, not bitter. Well, the thing is, without God, we just get bitter. There is no better. We don't we don't improve it in, in our state. So for thousands of years, God's people have been praying and asking God this question. The same question many of you are probably asking, maybe daily. <laughs> uh, how much longer, Lord? How much longer? You ever pray that? You ever pray, God, how much longer? Like, how much longer do I got to wait before you fulfill your promise, before you take vengeance? Because God says, vengeance is mine, right? I will repay. So he's promised us already. Listen, uh, uh, vengeance belongs to me. Vengeance is my property. I will enact it. Okay, God, then we wait. Then we wait. But how much longer until you take vengeance on those people who abused or persecuted there's christians today languishing in jails now all over the world praying this prayer praying to this effect and you know it breaks my heart that these precious saints our brothers and sisters are rotting and dying in these dirty communist jails because their only crime was that they dared to name the name of Jesus in a hostile place. That's their only crime. They dare to name the name of Jesus in a hostile place. Now, the official record won't say that. The official record won't say Christian. The official record is always, um, how should I say this? Um, twisted. They are often uh, put in jail for pedophilia. Or heinous crimes that society will look at and go, oh, look at how bad this person is. But it's false accusations. Just like Jesus, he was falsely accused. He was brought before the courts and they told all kinds of things. Oh, he wants to change the law and he blasphemed and, and he's this and he's that. It was all false. Every single crime that Jesus was um, um, crucified for was a false accusation. He didn't do those things. How much longer until vengeance comes? I mean, do you feel this way? Are you fed up with the evil? Are you fed up with the sin? Jack, listen to me. If you don't stop, go sit Go sit with Ginga now, or you're going upstairs. Okay, go. 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 Yeah, I'm, I feel fed up a lot <laughs> with, with the sin in the world. So today we're going to get a small glimpse into the final end time vengeance of God. So this is going to get a little crazy. It's going to get a little um, intense. But take heart because your prayers for justice are precious to God and he will avenge all his people. So let's go ahead and read Revelation 8 and verse 1. Can you bring me my Bible, please, Henry? Thank you. 
Yeah, just go ahead and bend every page. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good job. Revelation 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So, if you remember when John was given the, the, the vision of the heavenly throne, temple throne room there, he saw, remember, this, the scroll with the seven seals in the hands of God there. So, then what did he see? Remember, he saw a lamb who was slain, and no one in heaven or under the earth or, or, or above the earth or on the earth or whatever, no one was found worthy to open the seal. So, what is so significant about these seals? Well... If you remember, the seals uh, represented the end times final judgment of God. Unless the seals are opened and the scroll revealed, God's judgments will not come to pass and his promises will forever be frozen. That's not what we want. That's what the, the world might want. but That's not what God's people want. But he saw the lamb, this lamb, as though it was slain, but it was still standing. The lamb was found worthy. And so what did he do? He began opening the seals one by one. And John sees this broad view of history and the judgments of God in the end coming to pass. And finally, we are arriving here at the seventh seal, the final seal. And when he opens the seventh seal, something strange happens. There's silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, before this, there's been a lot going on in heaven. There's a lot, a lot of stuff happening, plagues and, and all kinds of cataclysmic events. And, and then so when it comes to the final seal, we would think a final climactic like explosion, something epic would happen. But what happens is he cracks the seal and it's just whew, silence for half an hour. The seven seals follow a general pattern. After every seal is broken, something intense happens, something uh, action packed, but not this time. 30, mo 30 minute moment of silence. This is, we're not used to this sort of thing happening in Revelation, right? We were, if, you read, if you read the book throughout, you get to this point, and you're kind of like, really? All that to get to the final seal and just silence? What's the silence about? I mean, think about this. If you're somewhere and there's a lot going on and then suddenly, boom, it's just radio silence. Pretty awkward. Pretty awkward, right? I mean, if I were to stop talking for 30 minutes and just look at you. that w You would prefer death over that, I think. <laughs> like, just kill me. Don't do that. Don't just stare at me for 30 minutes and say nothing. Silence in the Bible communicates something though there's nothing in revelation that's not symbolic of something or trying to communicate something so this communicates and represents god's intense awful judgments okay so in the book of zephaniah the prophet writes about the day of the lord and it's all over the prophets this term the day of the lord the final day the final judgment however you want to say it um so the final end time judgment of God, when the full fury of the wrath of the Almighty is poured out on the wicked. So here's how Zephaniah uh, uh, describes it here in Zephaniah 1. He says, be silent before the Lord God. There it is, right in the beginning. Be silent, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. On, and on the day of the Lord's sacrifice... I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. Oh boy, violence and fraud. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants, for all, all in, sorry, wail, O inhabitants, of the mortar. I'm not sure what that is. For all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. Whoa. At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish the men who are compl complacent. Those who say in their hearts. The Lord will not do good. Nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered. And their houses laid waste. Though they build houses. They shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards. They shall not drink wine from them. So. Here we have a picture of the final. And uh, judgment of God. And what, is, what does the prophet say? Shh. 
be silent. Don't say a word. Here's what was happening. The officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves. Who are these people? These are the politicians, the elite. And they're arraying themselves. They have nice attire. And on that day, uh, they will be punished. Why? Because they filled their master's house with what? What were the two things they filled their master's house? Do you remember? Violence and fraud. Let me ask you. What? <laughs> I don't even have to ask you. Violence and fraud is what is happening in our culture today. Fraud rampant. It's built right into our financial system. It's The whole thing is a fraud. It's literally a big scam. Um, and violence, which ensues. Because you can't, you can't defraud the entire world and not expect people to get violent about that. You can't defraud the entire world and not, be, and not prop that up on violence. Because eventually people are going to be like, listen, we don't like being defrauded. So the only way to keep the fraud going is with a, with a hammer fist. So... They're complacent. Listen, how, what, what is the cry of our culture? Is it not? The Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. There probably is no God. He's not going to do bad. He's not, nothing. Just stop being a conspiracy theorist. Take your tinfoil hat off. God's not going to judge the world. Come on, man. You're crazy. You're crazy. But this idea here is that the final judgment of the Lord is so awful. It's so dreadful that all creation just falls silent. Like, there's nothing that, there's nothing. You ever been so, you ever see something so shocking, so appalling? There's just nothing, no words to, to describe it. You're just like silent. This is what's being described here. Be silent. Words cannot express the devastation against the wicked. So there's 30 seconds, or seconds, 30 minutes rather, of silence through heaven all the heavenly beings all the angels all the elders all the saints everyone's just like <gasps> wow we got nothing there's no words to describe this now remember in revelation 6 10 the believers who were under the altar crying out to god what did they ask him remember what they asked him they asked how long until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth so here they are in heaven, and they're, and they're praying to God under the altar, and they're asking, Lord, how long? How much longer until you avenge us? So the sixth and seventh seal are both dealing with this final judgment here. And God now is finally answering their prayers. He's saying, this is how long. This is when I will avenge. This is what it'll look like. And it's so horrifying that creation collectively takes a gasp and sits in appalled silence for 30 minutes. And, and I shudder to think of the devastation of this. People just, people in our generation just don't get this. Um, they think the wrath of God is a joke. They think Jesus is a joke. They think it's just whatever. It's, it's silliness. Those who hate God, those who persecute his people, they have no idea of the cosmic tsunami headed, <laughs> headed their way. So look at Psalm chapter 2. Okay, Psalm chapter 2 describes it this way. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So what's happening here? The rulers of the earth are setting themselves against God. Okay? This has been happening for a long time. It's not new. It's not just today that this, this, this is happening, although it is happening today. So today we have the rulers, and they're setting themselves against God. Uh... Biden, Trudeau, you name the ruler, they're setting themselves against God. They're, 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 they're decreeing things against God. All these different bills that are passing through, they're against the Lord here. And they're actually, actually, Trudeau went out and said that the male and female binary is, should, should, be, should be done away with. You shouldn't even have it. So what does God do? What does God do? The rulers are setting themselves. All the kings of the earth are coming together and they're saying, we need to 
free ourselves from the Lord. We need to free ourselves from, from his restrictive ways, male and female. We don't need that. We need to, we need to burst their bonds, right? That's what it says. And what does God do? Is he, what's he doing in heaven? Is he sitting there going, oh, no, this is bad. I really hope they don't succeed. Oh, my gosh, I'm stressed. No, it says, look it. He who sits in heaven laughs. He laughs. God laughs. He, he holds them in derision. You know what that means to be held in derision? He makes fun of them. He mocks them. <laughs> right? He sits in heaven. He sees the Trudeaus and the Bidens, and he makes fun of them. Look at these guys. Look at these clowns here. They think that they can burst. The, they think they can defeat me. They think they can somehow come against me, these guys. These created uh, worms here. Come on. It's funny to God. He laughs. He laughs. God has not forgotten, nor will he allow the suffering of his people to go unchecked. So take comfort in that. When when you're being persecuted or whatever and, and having a hard time because of your Christian faith, just know God is laughing at your enemies. And maybe we should join him in his laughter. Maybe we should laugh too. Ask the Lord, God, help me to, to laugh at my enemies when they think they can defeat you. Because truly, if you think logically about it, it is pretty funny, right? It, it is comical that human beings think they could fight God <laughs> or something and somehow win. It, it is kind of funny. It is kind of funny. God does not forget your prayers, and he will not forget his promise. So verse chapter, verse chapter 2, sorry, verse 2 here. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and the seven trumpets and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So John looks and he sees the seven angels that were there, right? I mean, we've seen these these angels all throughout the book here and they're given seven trumpets. And this is telegraphing that although the seals are over, right? We've been through the seven seals now. The vision is not. So after the seven seals wraps up comes seven trumpets. So John's thinking, okay, the seven seals are done, right? We're, we're good. Nope. Seven trumpets are coming on the way, but not yet. So after the angels get the trumpets, they kind of take a back seat for a minute because another angel steps up and he stands before the altar in the heavenly temple, you know, where the saints are praying. And he has a golden censer in his hand. And for those who don't know what a censer is, a censer is a rounded vessel, okay? And it's filled with burning coals. You put burning coals in it, and then you add incense to it. And when you add the incense, it would burn and allow the, the fragrance and the smoke to kind of come up through the vessel and, and spread and do what incense does. So this whole scene John is seeing is patterned after Leviticus 16. So this is why... You can't read the book of Revelation and ignore the Old Testament because then you just come up with wacky stuff. Dumb stuff. Interpretations make no sense. So this is what's happening. Leviticus, Leviticus 16. Listen to what it says. It's talking about the, uh, the temple um, uh, rituals here. So, and he shall take a censer full of coals from fire uh, from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. <laughs> okay, so this is the Day of Atonement. God saying, the high priest is going to take the censer, he's going to fill it with hot coals, he's going to go into the into the veil before the mercy seat, where the Ark of the Covenant is, where God dwells, He's going to put the incense in. It's going to cover the place and smoke. He's going to do all this so that he does not die. Okay, Because if you come into the presence of God uh, uh, as a sinful man and you don't do what he says, you die. That's just how it is. You, he's too holy for, for, for us to just waltz in there and be like, hey, God, how's it going? No, that's not how it works. So the high priest instru is instructed to do this. He burns the incense. And look at the parallels here, okay? Where are the saints who are crying to God for vengeance? Where are they? They're in the heavenly temple under what? Under the altar. Okay. Where are the hot coals taken from in Leviticus? They're taken from the altar. Now, Psalm 141 verse 2. Let my prayer 
be counted as incense before you. Okay, let's make some connections. So the Old Testament's telling us the hot coals for the temple censer are taken from the altar. Revelation is telling us that in the heavenly temple, the dead uh, saints who are in heaven are praying um, <laughs> under the altar. And the Old Testament also tells us that the prayers of God's people are incense before him. So mash it together. What do we see? Revelation's telling us the smoke of the heavenly incense rises up before God with the prayers of the saints. Take it all together, mash it together, and this is what's being said. The prayers of God's people are so precious to him that he keeps them in bowls in heaven. And he, 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 he hoards all the prayers and he puts them in the bowls and he waits. Why? I'll tell you why. <laughs> Think about that. When you're suffering on account of the Lord, when you're persecuted for his name, when all the suffering and pain, when it boils over and you cry out to God, how much longer God catches that and he puts it in a bowl? He puts it aside. It's, it's, it's incredible to think about. So never, never think for a single moment that your prayers have no effect. Sometimes we may be praying and it feels like it's just bouncing off the ceiling. And, or they're being lost. They're just kind of going out into the vastness of heaven and, and being lost there. In those moments when it feels hopeless, remember how precious your prayers are to God. They're like the sweet aroma of incense. God loves them. He delights in the prayers of his people. He will not delay to answer them. If only we will believe this. If only I will believe this. We would pray with more expectation. We would pray with more hope. There's countless times in these last three years I've prayed, Lord, how much longer? How much longer till the border opens? <laughs> well, finally it's open. But how much longer? Let's not forget what occurred. Don't forget what the godless have done, the tyrants in our nation, how they arrested God's servants because they had the audacity to open their churches and, and to bid people to come, come to the Lord, come learn about Jesus. The crime of these men was simply this, offering the hope of the resurrection. Come and hear about Jesus. Oh, there's a virus that's supposed to be killing everyone? Well, you better all get right with God. Because if you're going to die, you want to go be with the Lord. No, don't do that. Go to jail. People are today are saying, Alan, stop talking about this. It's just water under the bridge now. Come on, can't you just get over it? Move on. But let me just say this. All those prayers we prayed, all those prayers believers have prayed, when they cried out, how much longer, God? When, you know, Pastor Tim Stevens there, I think it was in Edmonton, I think, I don't know, somewhere in Alberta, when he was arrested and his children were there and they were crying, Dad, why are they taking Daddy? Why are they taking Daddy? Because he preached the gospel. That's why they're taking Daddy. Don't let, the, let those images be seared in your mind and remember, remember those prayers and don't forget that when those prayers were prayed for Tim Stevens and his children, God snatched them up and he put them in a bowl and he put them aside and he remembered them. Those prayers are not water, water under the bridge. God's not in heaven going, well, it's been three years. Let me just dump these prayers into the ocean, the vast ocean of forgetfulness. No, no, no. They're still there. They're still there. They've been collected, added to the bowl of incense awaiting the final seal, awaiting the final judgment. When the incense of your prayers are poured into the censer of hot coals and those prayers burn like smoke and rise up before God's throne. And what happens? What happens when that finally happens? Well, check this out. This, when I read this, I was like, wow. This blew me away. Maybe it'll blow you away. Maybe it won't. But I hope it does. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, what's going on here? This is so, so finally the bowls, or the bowl rather, where God has taken all the prayers and collected them, is um, filled, he filled it with fire with the hot coals from the altar. And what does he do with it? He just chucks that thing to earth, just whips it down there. It's, it's full. Okay, God, uh, at the fire. Yep, there's the coals. It's burning. And then he just chucks that thing down to earth. You ever think about this? Like, what the heck is that? Why is he doing that? Henry gets it. Why? Why do that? Okay, 
when it smashes into the earth, what happens? John hears, hears peals of thunder and rumblings. He sees lightning and there's an earthquake. So what's he seeing here? Well, if you jump to Revelation 11 and verse 19, there's almost an identical description concerning the last judgment. It says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Revelation 16, 17, and 18, sort of the same thing. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth, so great was the earthquake. These are the same events being told three different from three different angles. The seventh seal had the censer being thrown the earth, thrown to the earth, uh, and there was thunder, lightning, earthquake. Seventh trumpet, same effect, uh, uh, thunder, lightning, earthquake. And the seventh bowl, same thing, thunder, lightning, and an earthquake. God is fulfilling his promise to judge the earth and destroy the wicked from it. So here's what absolutely stunned me. Here's what was absolutely amazing when I realized what was happening here. Think about the picture being painted here, okay? As I stated earlier, our prayers are being stored in these incense bowls in heaven, okay? And at the time of the end, they will be lit up. The fire, the hot coals will be added to it and it'll burn and there'll be smoke and incense and then the whole sensor, the whole thing, as it's burning, will just be chucked down the earth, to, to the earth. God's judgment on the wicked earth dwellers, as Revelation calls them, is to take, listen to this, to take the anguished prayers of his saints and to throw them to the earth. God takes your prayers and he uses them as his, <laughs> think about this, he uses your prayers, you, me. As the end time cosmic missile to judge the earth. He throws it down there. He weaponizes your prayers. I'll get, I'll get there. I'll get there. All the times you cried out to God for relief. All the many prayers of God's people in jail. Of the wife who lost her husband because he was martyred. The prayers of the crying child whose Christian's parents were killed for their faith. All those prayers will be bottled up. It will burn before God's nose. And he'll say, take that thing and chuck it to earth. Throw it down there. Let them know where this is coming from. All the rage and the fury of the Almighty will be <laughs> bottled up in those prayers. And it will just be chucked to earth. And when that thing hits the earth, boom. There's no coming back. There's no hope now. There's no hope now. And it's your prayers. All of them will be scattered to the four corners of the earth. It will trigger the cataclysmic destruction of all those who hate God and who sought to destroy his people. It's the same picture being painted in Ezekiel 10. Look what Ezekiel 10 says. Then I looked and behold on the expanse uh, that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire in appearance, like a throne. And he said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the whirling wheels underneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. Scatter the burning coals in the skitty, skitty, city. <laughs> Wipe from the land all the evil earth dwellers. That, that should be the, the word when God judges people. He, the skitty is coming. <laughs> Show no pity. Destroy them all. The prayers of my people, the suffering of my people, will be the fodder, the fuel, the fire that consumes in my judgment from my throne. From the king on his throne to the peasant in the street. Ezekiel 10 is the judgment that falls on all the people in Jerusalem for their sin, who were not marked on their foreheads with the mark of the Lord. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So remember... The saints who are sealed with the name of God on their foreheads are kept safe. The judgment, the desolation that falls on those not marked uh, uh, comes with the prayers of the saints. So the picture is plain to see to anyone who wants to listen. God will see his people through to the victory and he will pierce his enemies through with your anguished prayers. Think about this. <clears throat> This reality is something that I, 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 like, as I'm writing this sermon, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how can I, how can I preach this? How can I, this is, this is crazy to, to think about. Um, the fact that these prayers of our, ours, these prayers we pray, 
will be, it's as if they will be ringing in the ears of the wicked when God comes to destroy them. Have you ever thought about that? That's, what, that's what's being said. God throws your prayers to earth. And when it hits earth, boom, the final day of the Lord happens. And it's almost as if God's trying to say, your enemies, those who persecuted you, those who, who, who came after you who, for my namesake, when I finally judge them, all they're going to be hearing in their ears is your voice. Your prayers are going to be ringing through their ears as they're destroyed. That's what's being, I mean, am I making this up? That's what's being said here. This is something like, like it's, it's too much to comprehend for me. It's almost like God's saying the last thing they will hear before they die is your prayer against them. It's the last thing they will hear. Like, wow. Look at no wonder God says this. So you thought taking vengeance, you think taking vengeance might be a good idea? There's nothing you can do that's more horrifying than, than what I just described. <laughs> Deuteronomy 32, 35, God says, Vengeance is mine. In recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. God says, vengeance is mine. And no matter how much you want to take revenge, God will do a better job at it. <laughs> he will do a better job. And it, it will probably even horrify you. It will probably even horrify you, right? Right? Somebody does something against your loved one and you just want to destroy this person. But then when you see the vengeance of God, you might go, whoa, whoa, like, God, settle down. <laughs> that's a lot. Like, that's crazy. Like, I wanted to destroy this person, but you, whoa. So leave it to the Lord because his vengeance might even horrify you when you see it against your enemy. So, okay. <laughs> um, we don't talk about god's vengeance much in in modern churches right we would ra rather hear the nice stuff we would rather hear god's love the love of god and how he's so kind to us and all this type of stuff but let me just wager no that's not the right term let me just suggest this that this is the nice stuff now you might think alan you're nuts maybe i am but if you understand this properly this is the nice stuff because this passage was written to comfort us um, you know, for me, it's comforting to know that God's vengeance is for his people, that he's our defender. It's comforting for me to know I don't have to, um, be responsible for dealing out justice. I mean, the Bible does say do justice, establish justice, right? But it doesn't say, um, that you will, if you don't succeed in establishing justice, it's your fault. That's not what it says. It says, do right, establish justice, walk with God. But if there's no justice in the land and you're doing all that, it's not your fault. You did, their, you did, you, you did your part. So what this passage is, is comforting me with is the fact that even if I fail, even if nobody listens to me, even if I'm like the prophet Jeremiah and, and God tells Jeremiah, go and speak my word. But guess what? No one will listen. <laughs> go ahead. You have to do it. I'm commanding you to do it. But no one will listen. But do it anyways. So even if that happens, it's comforting to know God is our defender. And people will always say, you know, the Lord is my shield and my defender. But don't you realize what that really means? This is what it means, that God is your defender. It means he bottles up your prayers and he uses them as a missile to destroy your enemies eventually. So rejoice and thank him for it all, because your prayers are not for nothing. He hears, he is strong. And he's storing them for that day when your prayers will be hurled to earth and used as the trigger um, for his vengeance. So, that's a heavy message. That's a heavy message. What shall we say to these things? What shall we do with these things? Well, pray. <laughs> we shouldn't be shocked or surprised by any of this. Paul said, Beloved, Never avenge yourselves. Why? But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So the Apostle Paul says, Don't don't avenge yourselves. Remember what it says in Deuteronomy. Right? He quotes from it. Vengeance is mine. 
the verse 20 to the contrary now this is this is the part that i was like whoa i made this connection that i never made check this connection out to the contrary if your enemy's hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him something to drink for by doing so you will heap what burning, burning coals on his head do you, did you see the connection here with the burning coals now when you turn away from avenging yourself you are heaping what on your enemy's head burning coals what does the angel throw down to heaven from heaven to trigger the end times what was it a censer full of burning coals prayer your prayers and i guess we can even add now your blessings of your enemies <laughs> when you bless your enemies god even stores that up and he says okay this is some good fuel for my missile here <laughs> pray for your enemies bless those who curse you why because in order to deflect from yourself vengeance and deflect it to God. It's almost like when you pray for your enemies, when you bless your enemies, what you're doing is this vengeance that you want to take. You're taking it and it's bouncing off your prayers and it's bouncing off of your blessing for your enemy and it's bouncing to God and then he catches it and he stores it away for later. If they get saved, good, right? Perfect. If you pray for your enemies and you bless them and they come to the Lord, that's, that's even better. Then, then the, those burning coals get stored away for somebody else. But take comfort in this, that God will deal with them one way or another. And your prayers, they're precious to God. Be assured, be assured beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will avenge all his people. The incense being collected, the burning coals heating up, and the censer being polished. Jesus is going to wrap this thing up, but he has some unfinished business. So trust him today. Pray and rest in his plans. Do not avenge yourselves. Instead, as the Apostle Paul says, leave it to the wrath of God. So with that, let's send up some uh, heavenly missile fuel and pray. That's what I'm going to call it from now on. From now on, whenever we pray, I'm going to say let's... No, I'm just going to say let's pray. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your word that is uh, ever true and challenging, um, but comforting for us. I ask you, Lord, to help me and to help all of us, Lord, to be your servants, to do faithfully, to walk in justice and mercy. Um, and uh, God, help us to pray. Lord, that's, that's, I guess that's my number one prayer right now, is that we would pray. You would give us the... Uh, desire to pray that you would put in us like a um just a burning desire that we just have to pray that we can't we can't skip this that's just that we want to do it that we delight in it uh let us let us view prayer like food like we have to eat we can't go well, maybe we can go a day without food but we can't go a week or a month without food that's crazy and let that be how we view prayer too that we must pray we must we must feed off your word and we must uh, come to you. So, Lord, uh, help us in that. And let us, until that day, um, be your your faithful servants who, who don't take vengeance, who, who leave it to the wrath of God and who trust you with it. Because um, we know that you're able uh, to, to, to avenge much, much more efficiently than we are. We thank you and honor you in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.